last for the last part of the conference we'll be using an exciting tool called slido which is a question and answer um uh app i would call it and um it's we we would request that all delegates use their phones to scan the qr code on your screen and it's designed to work with your mobile device or on a desktop and we have a corresponding hashtag to enable you to join so you can scan the qr code and then it'll open a page where you can send in questions during the presentations. Yeah. And so for this session, you'd pick session five. And then throughout the presentations, um, we'll be moderating the questions. And once they're moderated, they'll appear on our screen, which um, the organizers will project. And we think it's an exciting way to answer questions so that um, everybody can engage and interact. And um, you can, if, if for instance, someone has asked what you wanted to ask, you can vote up a question. Yeah. So we think it's an interesting and exciting way to engage. Yeah. Thank you, Lucky. So just before Lucky starts, could I just remind all attendees to please kindly mute um, their microphones um, and just turn off their cameras. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Fala and Dr. Joy. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great. Okay, mine is very quickly just to introduce the moderator who's going to take us through the um, the session, the next session, which is on anti money laundering uh, global south perspectives. And um, the moderator for this session is Mr. Ebiri Ebiri. And um, Ebiri's journey began as an in house counsel when he was practicing law. Uh, with top commercial firms in Lagos and in the United States, he was in the um, he was in the later uh, he was in the later. It was later that he obtained his LLM at NYU um, as an Arthur T. Uh, Vanderbilt scholar. Arthur T. Vanderbilt, I think, was the former um, Chief Justice for New Jersey um, at the Supreme Court of New Jersey. Uh, over the years, he built experience with the capital markets and financial teams of Olaminu Ajayi LP, Templars, and PUNUKA attorneys, all in Lagos, and settled Austin LLP in New York, as well as International Monetary Fund in Washington, D.C. Um, he reminisces about his years in Ola, Olaminu Ajayi LP um, that I had a role, I had role models who believed in my ability and entrusted top notch and complex assignments to me. This helped me develop legal skills and ability to take up more tasks and deliver, he says. Uh, Egberi has been a principal legal counsel with FDB headquarters in Abidjan, Cote d'Ivoire since October 2018. In his capacity, he advises and supports the bank treasury on borrowing in international and local capital mark money markets, as well as negotiation and documentation of derivatives and other risk management transactions. He also supports the AFDB Resource Mobilization and Partnerships Department in uh, establishing trust funds, um, special funds, and other resource mobilization efforts. So I will hand over to Mr. Ebiri. Thank you very much, Lucky Star, for that very kind introduction. Um, without any much further ado, I would just like us to go into this next session that is captioned anti-money laundering global south perspective and i'm just going to generally introduce all the very formidable uh speakers we have gathered for this very session and since you already have each uh since you already have the citation of each one of them i'll just go straight to call them so that 
I don't stand on the way of you listening to these very fantastic speakers. So firstly, we have Professor Abdullahi Sheu, who is a Nigerian ambassador designate to the Russian Federation. And after him, we have Dr. Constance uh, V.W. Jikonyo, who is of the University of Nairobi. And then thereafter, we have Dr. Nkechiku Azinge, who is of the University of Lincoln. And then thereafter, we have Ms. Uh, sorry if I, if, I, if I pronounce your name in a way that uh, you wouldn't want it to be pronounced. I'm just trying to uh, be as proper as possible in the pronunciation of the names. I, I, uh, after that will be Ms. Cheludo Timaye Butale of the Cyprus International University. And then thereafter, we we'll hear from Dr. Chijoke, Chijoke Ofoji of the Liverpool John Moss University. So uh, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Professor Abdullahi Shew, uh, who is Nigerian ambassador designated to the Russian Federation. And he's going to be speaking to us on the topic, resolving the paradox of customer due diligence, a global South perspective. Over to you, Professor Shehu. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, can you see my slide? Yes, we can see your slides. We will share them from this end for you. Uh, okay, I don't need to bother myself from here. No, you do not. Just let our um, presenter know um, when you want the next slide to appear. Thank you. Also, I should be saying next, 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 rather than seeing it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you. Okay, no problem. Well, um, thank you so much, um, ladies and gentlemen. Let me begin by thanking Inkechi and uh, Falasha, they really for your tenacity and commitment to this project. And uh, I'm glad to see you people very active on this project and where you have reached thus far. Um, I am here to lend my uh, support uh, to, to, to this project and also my association with the Global South Dialogue on Economic Crime. Now, you asked me to talk about uh, resolving the paradox of customer due diligence. Therefore, um, I have an outline. The next, next, next slide. Okay, uh, I'd like to begin by some imaginary statistics that I have. Uh, drawn from the World Bank in 2018, uh, where it is estimated that about 1 billion people around the world face challenges in proving who they are. And about 1 billion people uh, believe to live uh, without an official proof of identity. 81% uh, of this figure live in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. 47% uh, are below the national ID age of their own country or their countries. 63% live in lower middle income economies, while 28% live in lower uh, income economies. Now, what does this suggest? This suggests the challenges associated with uh, customer due diligence as a model for the prevention and control of money laundering globally. Next, next slide. Uh, in response to the challenges of money laundering, the FATA was established in 1989, and it develops a, uh, a set of 40 recommendations, which is commonly referred to as the acceptable international uh, standards uh, on, against money laundering. And about 60% of these standards consist of standards that have to do with uh, customer due diligence. Customer due diligence is based on effective anti-money laundering risk-based approach. In other words, uh, reporting entities to know their customers, KYC, which is the bedrock of the specific recommendations of the FATF for the prevention of money laundering contained in recommendations 9 to 23. Specifically, recommendation 10, which is meant for financial institutions and recommendation 22, meant for designated non-financial uh, professions and businesses. 
these are the component blocks for enforcing uh, due diligence, particularly knowing your customer uh, within the framework of the FATF standard. CDD requirements generally include prohibition of uh, anonymous accounts or accounts in fictitious names. And this applies to financial institutions and therefore financial institutions are required under CDD to identify and verify the identity of their customers using reliable, dependable and verifiable documents, data or information. Uh, I'm being very precise, but I would like to draw your attention to the adjectives that have been used in the FATM standard. The words that have been are used are very carefully selected. Financial institutions or reporting agent entities are also required to identify the beneficial owner of each and every transaction. They are to understand and maintain or obtain information on the purpose and nature of each business relationship with their customers. And most importantly, they are to conduct ongoing due diligence, in other words, to scrutinize every customer they deal with, to know the customer very well so that they are sure that their transactions are devoid of money laundering. Next slide. To do this, the FATF has developed several guidance notes in order to assist uh, countries across the world to enforce CDD measures. In 2013, the FATF developed the guidance on AML safety and financial inclusion. Financial inclusion is actually one of the best approaches to resolve the paradox of CDD. It also developed the guidance on risk-based approach, uh, which is basically based on the risk perception, not necessarily the customer's perception, but the risk perception or the perception of risk in every jurisdiction. Uh, it also developed a paper on low capacity countries to enable them address significant and strategic issues that conform them with respect to enforcing effective customer due diligence uh, measures in their respective institutions. The Basel guidance, which was issued in 2014, complements the FATF uh, standards and guidance with respect to this. Overall, the global mutual evaluation reports serve as parameters for reviewing and updating compliance with the FATF standards with respect to due diligence and other compliance issues uh, generally in the prevention and control of money laundering, terrorist financing, and the financing of weapons of mass destruction. Next. Graphically, in, in the African situation, for example, I believe when NKT is going to talk, she's going to highlight the challenges encountered with respect to enforcing uh, CDD in Africa. And this is graphically what I use to demonstrate what goes on with respect to enforcing CDD. First of all, the money laundering and terrorist financing risk must be understood through a national risk assessment. Secondly, there must be consistent um, STR and, ST and CTR reporting by reporting entities, not only financial institutions. And then there should be significant records keeping. Now, when this are achieved, there must be effective investigation as well as good FIU analysis in order to turn the SGRs into qualitative intelligence for action. Where that is done, the financial institutions, particularly the regulators, will enforce that by effective AML safety inspection. This will now support the outcome of investigation in the form of confiscation of proceeds of crime, and that will provide 
a robust AML CFT regime in any system. So this is simply the cycle that I tried to characterize uh, in this uh, presentation. Next slide, please. Uh, for us to be able to understand and how to resolve the paradox of CDD, we must first of all understand the factors that inhibit CDD in the first place. And these are many. The first broad category has to do with the legal gaps. If there is no sufficient laws, or if the laws do not provide clarity for entities to comply, there will certainly be a problem with CDD. Secondly, when there is regulatory gaps, including lack of capacity of the regulatory authorities, for example, to ensure regular inspection and supervision of reporting institutions. Thirdly, poor infrastructure to support all efforts. For example, the absence of a national central identification database or the reliability of the database or the identities themselves. Now, other challenges that uh, affect the effective enforcement of CDD include the unreliability of the means of identification, particularly in many African countries, where you find that they have not actually established the national identities and where the national identity cards are provided, uh, some are either forged or stolen. Post street naming and numbering also affects customer due diligence, especially where financial institutions are required to, to verify the identity of their customers by visiting the given address of their clients. So in Africa, this is a major challenge. Another challenge has to do with cultural issues. Uh, they believe that people say, well, we don't want people to know that we have money, so we prefer to keep it in the house. So this leads to a lot of cash being in circulation. Uh, again, the issue of competition among banks will make them to compromise uh, certain CDD measures, as well as um, insider dealings and tip off. Well, this is not only common to Africa, this is a general problem. So what I'm trying to say in a nutshell is that while some of these challenges are peculiar to Africa, a good number of them also apply to uh, other developed economies. And this is the reason why it is important uh, to ensure that there is global coordination in implementing the appropriate standards. Next slide. Now, my final point is I try to attempt to make some prognosis on how to resolve the paradox. And I look at it from two responsibilities. Uh, at the national authorities level, countries must establish, strengthen, and harmonize the identification system. Secondly, they need to improve their streets numbering. And thirdly, they need to promote financial inclusion. This is where there are a number of issues. Financial inclusion will require a reduction in cash transactions or placing a limit in cash transactions. It will also require the establishment of microfinance in order to bring financial services closer to people who are considered unbankable. It may also require provision of innovative money laundering uh, services, including different uh, money laundering, uh, cryptocurrency, et cetera, et cetera, that uh, were discussed uh, during the previous session. So in my view, these responsibilities can only be achieved at the national level when there is a comprehensive legislation in place and there is a political will to really ensure that uh, the legislation is enforced. Next. Now, from the part of reporting entities, they also have certain responsibilities. One, they have to ensure the collection of appropriate CDD information from the first point, uh, contact, point of contact with their clients. 
they need to know what sort of information they must obtain from their clients and how they can manage such information according to law. Secondly, they need to deploy effective AML CFT solution software, which is very common now, and technology has already helped in the prevention and control money laundering. Thirdly, they should establish policy and procedures to processes to identify beneficial ownership in every transaction. Four, they, have, they may use alternative means of identification where it is difficult for some people or bankable customers to have means of identification. You may rely on their voters registration cards or biometric verification system, or even you rely on traditional means of where most people are, or some people are illiterate. So this may be very helpful. Number five, it is important that there is continuous training for financial institutions, especially those that are involved in anti-money laundering supervision uh, and uh, enforcement. Six, all institutions or reporting entities must be made to develop a robust database for monitoring of politically exposed persons. Seven, they must introduce low risk banking with respect to financial products and services. They should make some of the products less attractive for money laundering purposes. And most importantly, they must enforce a risk based approach for CDD to be effective. Next. In conclusion, I would like to state in, in a nutshell that it is not only about compliance, it's about effective coordination. When there are effective systems in other parts of the world and any part of the world is not effectively regulated, then the weak link would create the opportunity and vulnerabilities for money laundering. However, with respect to the enforcement of the FATF standards, which are expected to be rolled out all over the world, regardless of the state of development of our countries, there is no one fits all solution. So what is it in it for me should be the approach that everybody has a stake in what we are doing for everybody to contribute. Now, when I look at the screen here, I look at Falasha Day's picture smiling at me. I am beginning to ask myself whether I am in a technological world or I am in a physical world. I did not say you should remove it, Shadi. Now, the picture that was smiling there is exactly the Shadi that I can see. But that picture is showing me as if I'm in a new <laughs> technological world or where, where I am. Anyway, that is just uh, to close on a very uh, lighter mood. I would like to thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to contribute to your program, and I wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Shew, for that very insightful presentation. And uh, you know, uh, thank you so much for being able to talk to us about the paradoxical issues that are raised by the customer due diligence, uh, issues that we reg regard to the uh, FATF standards and or principles as the case may be recommendations. And um, thank you again for letting us know because uh, as you rightly pointed out, if all the countries are not working hand in hand, there will be an issue in terms of achieving a global uh, resolution of the paradoxes because you said uh, we are only as strong as our weakest link. And with that said, I'm going to go to the next uh, presenter on the panel. That would be Dr. Constance V. W. Jikoyo of the University of Nairobi. Professor uh, Dr. Jikoyo will be talking to us on the topic uncovering conflicts and ambiguities in the international anti-money laundering regime vis-a-vis -vis African country. I just wanted to let the uh, audience know that as uh, Dr. Malala pointed out at the beginning, you have the Slido 
where you can send in your questions so that at the end of the each uh, at the end of the session we'll be able to address questions and please when you are sending your question uh, please do well to point uh, sign post it to a particular panelist so that it will be addressed accordingly. Thank you. Dr. Jikoyo. Thank you, uh, Edri, for welcoming us for this session. And thank you to the organizers for the opportunity to be here today. So far, I have learned a lot myself. And uh, I hope that um, what I will share will equally be of interest. So as uh, the last presenter has said, a one size fits all does not work. I have had the interest of uh, looking at uh, the anti-money laundering regime in my country, which prompted me to get interested uh, whether some of the challenges I was seeing being faced in Kenya are the same in other African countries. And as I read more and more, I realized there were certain similarities that the African countries and as other global South countries or other developing countries uh, were facing in terms of implementing the, anti, the international anti-money laundering regime. So that is what I want to focus on today. What are the issues? Next slide, please. What are these issues? What are the the biases, the contradictions, the assumptions that were made when coming up with this anti-money laundering regime and asking the African countries uh, to implement it. Because the, the question so far has been that Africa has tried, but predominantly that it's not effective. And so the, 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 it has been argued that the Africans really just don't want to implement it. But when you interrogate the international anti-money laundering regime, you realize that there are other underlying aspects or issues that have actually read, led to the exa um, existing state of affairs. So then the question is, can we reverse it? And to be able to do so, we need to look at these underlying issues that need to be addressed. So I have, next slide, please. I have categorized these in um, five uh, subcategories. The developmental or historical uh, issues, the institutional issues, cultural issues, economic issues, and implementation uh, issues. So we will begin by looking at the developmental or historical issues. Next slide, please. This takes us to these key questions that we need to ask us. Who were the agents of the anti-money laundering policy transfer? What exactly was transferred from where and why? When did the transfer occur? Why did the African countries adopt the anti-money laundering policies in the manner that they did? And also, how did that transfer take place? Now, in answer to the first question, who are the agents? The agents actually, if you read historically, you will realize that the country that pushed the most for the anti-money laundering policy to be adopted was the US. Much of it is said to, uh, there's a, the story about anti-money laundering policy usually begins with the FATF where you had the G7 meeting that uh, led to its formation. But go behind the G7 meeting, it was actually America. Why did America seek to have these anti-money laundering policies, which they already had in their country? They realized that for them to work, they needed a global perspective. And so we need a global forum to push for that. And you discovered there were even tensions then with the formation with countries like um, France. But eventually, FATF was formed. Now, what exactly was transferred again? If you look again carefully, you will realize that much of what was being transferred then was actually policies that America 
had in place. Now, when did the transfer occur? The transfer occurred when the war, um, the, the formation of the FATF happened when the war on uh, drugs in America and organized crime was uh, at its peak. What about for us in Africa, when we were being made to adopt the AML policy? Most African countries either were still within uh, undergoing the structural adjustment programs implemented by the IMF, the World Bank, or they were now exiting. And we all know the history of what happened with most of those policies. So most African countries actually had no choice. They were cornered that we have to adopt. And that's why the last question, how did the transfer take place? Was it coercive or voluntary? It was actually not voluntary. It was uh, coercive. And in addition to that, comes in the aspect of mimicry, because the African countries felt we don't want to be left out. So we must mimic. We must do what uh, country X has done so that we are in the, uh, in the, the right light. The other aspect linked to mimicry is the fact that competition effects, and this is tied into the aspect of coercion, that if you do not, and if you read the history of a country like Nauru, Nauru really suffered when they purported to say they would not adopt the AML policy. They were actually, their, their, their banking industry suffered, almost collapsing. So when other countries, uh, African countries realize this, you realize you have no option. We must adopt it. So the transfer was not done voluntarily, but coercively. Now, all this together comes what the last speaker has presented, the issue of a one size fits all. We were given these policies and told, here you go, implement. There was no evaluation of the current system within the African countries to see whether this AML policy transfer would fit in well with what was happening economically, socially, financially within the African countries. It was these are the policies, make them work. So we as the Global South were not involved in developing these initiatives. Ours was just to adopt them. Now, this has actually led to some people saying that the adoption of the AML policy was some form of neo-colonialism. And as I said, if you look at this aspect in light of the fact that you know, most African countries had just come from this, uh, dealing with this issue of uh, structural adjustment programs, really, you would, you, you would understand why this uh, interpretation that uh, adoption of the AML policies was a form of neo colonialism. So we were implementing something that we really did not believe in, but because to be competitive at the global market, because if we do not, our financial systems will be shunned, could even lead to collapse, we will be uncompetitive globally, we had to do it. So this being the, the historical uh, manner in which we adopted the AML policies, some of these issues have continued to tag at the implementation of the AML policies in African countries. Next slide, please. Now, tied together with these developmental issues are the institutional ones, the fragmentation of uh, systems in Africa. And the previous presenter has highlighted back that a lot when it comes to, uh, for example, undertaking uh, customer due, diligence. We don't have central registries, for example, so that it becomes very difficult to conduct due diligence on uh, customers. In some countries, even a, a central registry for uh, corporate bodies like companies do not exist. So even establishing things like the ultimate beneficial owner of a company becomes difficult. Kenya is only now in the process of establishing the ultimate beneficial owner uh, registry. Looking even at our own land registration systems, most of the African countries, there's a problem. 
by the time because land is even communally owned. Then you have the delays in our judicial system, which lead to inefficiencies in administering uh, punishment. And then this is coupled with the aspect of lack of political will that at times those who are politically connected never really get punished. A case will be lodged in court, but somewhere after a lot of bulabalu, quietly, nothing happens and uh, we never hear again of the matter. Yet to properly implement the AML system and send the proper message, a properly functioning judicial system is very relevant. If even, for example, you are going to undertake a prosecution for money laundering and eventually undertake asset forfeiture, a properly fun functioning judicial system is uh, relevant. The other aspect uh, under institutional problems is the fact that the AML strategy focuses on private sector more for implementation, which therefore leads to the other problem. The public-private boundaries of governance have been crossed. So the private entities are feeling, look, this is not our role. Why are we as banks being required to undertake customer due diligence? That's not our work. Some of these things should be done by the, um, the government. Why should we tell on our clients? Uh, and the banks will ask that. For us, we are, we are here to make money. We want people to deposit money with us. We tra they transact this money. That's how we make a profit. But now that we are being told we must tell on our client if they deposit this amount of money, if they withdraw this amount of money, why should we? So that focus, and therefore, which means, by the way, that the cost to the private sector for implementation is really high. And there hasn't, it's only now that a dialogue between the two entities, public and private, is beginning in certain instances. It has been a case of government saying, private, you must do this, period. No discussion of how can we go about this? Can we really actually implement this? Can we talk? Can we modify this so that we are able to do it? Such conversations have actually not been held. Next slide, please. Then comes the cultural perspectives or cultural issues. And this, even in most lit literature, have actually been overlooked. But my view is that these are also very key in explaining the lackluster implementation of AML policies in Africa. When we talk about the lack of political will, it is tied to some certain cultural perspectives. Now, culture is not just about song and dance, the songs that we sing, the language that we speak. Culture encompasses very many things. How we as a people behave, how we think, how we view certain things. And that culture is passed on from one generation to the, ne to the next. It is as a result of socialization so that as a child, you will look at what your parents are doing and you emulate that. Your children look at what you're doing and continue to emulate that. So what are these cultural perspectives that tie with how AML is implemented in Africa? Now, first, much of the African society, we are moving from communal ownership of various, uh, be it land, be it wealth in whatever form, you know, even taking care of children was a communal aspect. It's only now, you know, you cannot go and be, uh, beat anyone's child if you find them doing something wrong. But before, it was very easy. I find you doing wrong. I'm like your mother. I beat you up and I move on. The concept of communal ownership or togetherness. But we are now moving to individualism. And this has come with the aspect of accumulation of wealth. And that we view, uh, that being the case, we view that the more wealth I have, the more society looks at me and says, I have made. And we respect them highly in society. You know, we will be telling our children, you need to be like so and so, they have made it. Are you seeing the houses this person owns, the vehicles they drive? And this now 
like for example in Kenya, drives people to do very absurd things or even illegal things to make that money. Which again now comes to the next point, the cultural perception, our orientation, what are our cultural morals and attitudes on various things. So that we really don't care, it's get rich quick. However you get your money, we don't want to know. Just get rich quick. Or if you happen to be in power, it's your turn to eat. And once you leave power, it is okay. The next uh, people coming in, it is their turn to eat. Dr. Jifu, so, you have three minutes to wrap up, please. Okay, Thank yes, please. And th that comes in with the aspect of cultural impunity. So instead of looking and saying that this is wrong, this is not right, we look at it as something good. The, the misconception in Africa that wealth equates to political and social power, for anyone to buy for a political seat, we look at how much wealth you have in most African countries. Then lastly, do we have even a culture of compliance in Africa? Generally, we tend uh, not to. For us to be able to achieve all what we have talked about before, to be seen to be rich, compliance is not for us. Next slide, please. Then comes the economic aspects, which have been touched on by a number of the presenters today. What does the model for AML suit the socioeconomic needs of Africa? We are a cash-based society. Our reliance on alternative means of value transfer, such as um, Hawala, the levels of development in society are low, so that you don't even have that many banked people. Yet the AML focuses so much on the banked members of society. What uh, Madame Buku spoke about, we rely on other means of money transfer more than even uh, the, the banks. Uh, next slide, please. Then comes the issues of compliance that I have already hinted upon. The cost of compliance is high. So most that dissuades entities from engaging or uh, attempting to begin uh, compliance. Then the gaps in implementation. Certain businesses have been excluded. Cash intensive businesses, very many of them have been excluded, which are relevant or would be relevant in the African uh, context. Then the financial and other uh, designated non-financial businesses and, past and uh, professions are expected to design their own preventative measures. Instead of a joint collaboration that pulls together the resources that are available so that you know, that lessens the burden and encourages uh, implementation of the AML policies. Then we need to also ask ourselves, do our regional bodies like the African Union have the capacity to assist us or to assist countries in implementation of these AML policies? Because certain countries have bigger problems at the moment to worry about, e.g. feeding their people and uh, sheltering them more than AML policies. Next slide, please. Dr. Jinko, I, I yes, hope that will be your concluding uh, slide because uh, you're, you're out of time, but please, can you conclude in one minute? Yes, please, yes, please. Then Thank we you. have the aspect of, um, we rely on outsiders to come and tell us our problems and tell us how to implement, yet instead of looking at our locals, people who understand the peculiarities of a particular country, so that we get what is best for us. Next slide, please. And I believe it is the last one. So what are the solutions? Include Africa in the agenda setting. Don't exclude us. Do not, the one size fits all approach is not working. Can African countries need each on their own to undertake their own risk assessment? There's also need to undertake a regulatory impact assessment so that you assess the cost and the benefits joint efforts pulling together so that we, the little resources we have, we see what we can do. Look, review the financial uh, reporting mechanisms and see so that we implement what works for us. Last slide, please. Develop systems that we can implement with the capacities that we have, right? And then look to each other as similar countries 
for policy transfer so that we, we are looking at countries that are experiencing same, similar challenges to us. And most importantly, self-reflection and examination as a country, look where the policy came from, what in, um, informed it ETC before we implement. And therefore work at adaptation, not just adopting, but adaptation. And lastly, we need political will to be able to implement. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Jinkoyo. That was a mouthful. And uh, I, I, I am very much confident that the audience have taken copious notes of your very, very insightful presentation. And without much further ado, I'm going to invite our next speaker, Dr. Nkechi Azinge uh, of the University of Lincoln. She will be speaking to us on the topic, AML, CFT, compliance challenges in African countries. Dr. Zinge, you have 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. If you could please unmute yourself so that we could hear you, please. Good day, everyone. Um, Dr. Fala, can you hear me? Yes, we can, Dr. Nkechi. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, good day, everyone. It's a pleasure to address you all this evening. So today I'll be speaking on the anti-money laundering compliance challenges in African countries. And my presentation takes the view that understanding Africa's compliance actually requires a connection of the dots, which according to Steve Jobs, as we all heard, we've all heard, um, arguably is best done looking backwards. Now, so I would adopt a contextual approach in framing my presentation. Give me a second, I'll just put this in presentation view. Okay. So I'll adopt a contextual approach in framing my presentation. My core argument is that there's actually a correlation between Africans' colonial history and its money laundering occurrences and regulation thereof. Yet the global standards adopted to combat these crimes and the benchmarking framework as well do not consider the continent's peculiarities and this is actually a problem which is a catalyst for paradoxical implications and also unintended consequences as, my, as the two earlier speakers have emphasized. So my arguments are presented in three parts. First, I'll discuss Africa's colonial history and its impact on money laundering regulation thereof. Secondly, I'll highlight the compliance trajectory of African countries. And lastly, I would examine the compliance challenges of African countries in brief, given the elaborate conversation by Dr. Constance. So as mentioned, I'll start by discussing the colonial history of African countries and its money laundering implications. Now, when we have conversations about colonialism, you would see that there's that eagerness to focus on slave trade, but there's minimal focus on how natural resources of African countries were brazenly stolen and extorted. Walter Rodney captured this up in his book, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, where he stated that colonial masters sought to repatriate the profits from exploitative activities on Africa's natural resources to the so-called motherland. Now, colonial masters employed a series of tactics to achieve their aims, including illicit transfers, exorbitant taxation, the granting of exclusive rights over mineral and natural resources to British firms. And the interesting part of all of this is that these strategies were actually legalized. Now, the prevalent exploitation by colonial masters actually set the tone for the decolonization struggle. So while African countries were pushing for independence, a number of African countries were pushing for independence, they faced pushback from their colonial masters who argued that the, the people at the forefront of the independence fight were actually corrupt, right? And they had cases of corruption, money laundering and bribery hanging on their neck. And for this reason, they were very ill prepared to take on independence. But subsequent reports revealed that the colonial masters had actually expected their colonies to behave this way, and they did. So, for instance, when countries gained independence, what we noticed is that political appointments were given to a lot of the, of the, of, of the freedom fighters. And these powers allowed them to issue licenses, to award contracts, to award scholarships, 
But the interesting part of this is that they exploited these, these, the, these, these um, avenues to gain kickbacks. And across African countries, or in many African countries, we saw the military regime coming in, taking power. In Nigeria, we saw about six military coups, uh, coups and what they were all fighting for was fighting against was corruption. But again, we saw in Nigeria, we saw that General Abacha was one of those who engaged largely in money laundering, which is beyond corruption. So whilst this focus, whilst the fight was against corruption, there was very minimal focus on money laundering. As Dr. Ginkoyo had mentioned, what we would see is that Africa's focus on money laundering was actually really belated. And that belated focus was actually engineered through a new colonialist agenda, which was actually spearheaded by the G7. So the group of seven countries, primarily the US, the UK and France came together, established the G7, and they already had, had existing frameworks within their, within, within their banking system, existing frameworks to combat money laundering. And they used these frameworks to set 40 recommendations on money laundering and terrorist financing, which were then applicable globally. Now, there are two important things to note, and I'll be repeating myself in this. First is that the source of the recommendations were derived from extant banking standards in the G7 countries. So arguably, what we'll then see is that if these countries are, are developing the standards, these standards are more suited, suited to, their, to their terrain. And secondly, what we'll then notice is that when you look at the membership of the FATF, you would see that the membership of the FATF is actually critical in shaping and reshaping its standards. Currently, we have 37 member countries. South Africa is the only African country that is currently a member of the FATF. Now, the absence of an institutional voice, as Professor Shehu had mentioned, we will then see that it's actually not unsurprising that the resultant framework actually lacks the nuances that would actually facilitate Africa's robust compliance. Then it begs the question, how does the absence of a voice alongside the many issues that resulted from colonialism actually reflect in Africa's compliance? So this brings us to look at Africa's compliance trajectory. Now, and this is the second part of my presentation. So with the FATF, what they do is that with countries, they go into countries, they conduct mutual evaluation, practically trying to rank how compliant each country is to the 40 recommendations. Now, once they rank these countries, for every recommendation, you're, you're, you're you, you know your compliance level to that recommendation. And then there are follow-up reports that, that happen every subsequent period, right? Now, so what I did is I examined the compliance trajectory of 38 African countries from 2007 to 2015 to see how they were complying, right? And with these 38 African countries, what I found was that only eight countries were able to record over 50% compliance. And guess what? South Africa, that is even a member of the FATF, was not the most compliant country. Egypt was actually the most compliant country, but still falling short of the 65% benchmark, right? So we see Egypt, Tunisia, Mauritius, and also um, South Africa doing quite well, but I would say that their compliance level is still apathetically low and it is not unsurprising. And what we'll then see is that at least 30% of these countries recorded less than 50% compliance level. So how best can the colonial history, coupled with the, nuanced, the lack of a nuanced approach, explain this. Give me a second. So um, this would practically reiterate a lot of the points that Dr. Dr. Ginkoyo made, but then I'll keep it brief. Well, I'll, say, well, I'll start by saying that Africa's colonial history has crippled its development across various facets, right? And one key area, it is ability to have the necessary preconditions to actually have necessary preconditions for effective regulation of money laundering, right? So we do not have what it takes to actually combat these crimes. And this can also be tied to the residues of colonialism. And there are two, two critical preconditions I noted. One is law and the second is confidence. Now, when I say confidence, confidence is more than the word confidence. Confidence in this case is synonymous to trust. And confidence in this case, basically when we say that we trust the country 
what, what you're then saying is that the, the trust you have in that country or the trust that people have in that country actually determines the extent of investment or engagement in that country's economy or financial system. But what we then see in African countries is that there's a crisis of confidence in Africa's political and governance system, and also in its regulatory and enforcement frameworks, even the judicial framework, as, as Dr. Kinkoyo mentioned. So what this does is that it not only undermines Africa's compliance, but it also hinders foreign direct investment. And the second I mentioned earlier is law, right? So the law, the law matters thesis will tell us that law is actually critical in combating financial crime, right? However, we see a perplexing picture in African countries as they engage in copy and paste, right? So in trying to transplant laws or transplant the FATF standards, it's let's copy this, let's paste this, right? Now, this is not the case with all the laws, but this is the case with some of the laws, right? Now, unsurprisingly, a few months ago, I was speaking with a staff of an international financial institution, and he mentioned that the laws in African countries are quite good. We see really good laws, and there are only minimal issues with the laws. Now, these so-called minimal issues actually have paradoxical implications. And in some, in some instances, transplantation is done in error, right? So let's take, for instance, Nigeria's attempt at regulating lawyers for money laundering. Now, the FATF designates lawyers as non-financial business professionals, meaning that they are gatekeepers. And the, the, the expectation is that lawyers would ensure that their clients do not use their services, so the lawyer's services to lend their money, right? Now, countries are expected to domesticate this standard with the requirement that lawyers engage in customer due diligence. So basically know your customer, know your client, know your client and ensure that you understand your client's business, right? And more importantly, lawyers are also to report suspicious transactions, emphasis on suspicious. Now, when you look at Nigeria's law, now that part of the law has now been expunged. Now, the, 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 the legislation actually revealed that the law mandated lawyers to submit every client transaction with a significantly low threshold of 1,000 pounds without any suspicion. Now that in itself was done erroneously and it is problematic. Now this in itself actually circumvents the spirit of the FATF recommendation and undermines legal professional privileges. Additionally, it demonstrates that transplanted frameworks do not necessarily make the journey and may be done in error due to disparity in understanding and perception. Now, irrespective of the erroneous transplantation and also the paradoxical impl implications, African countries are still listed by the Financial Action Tax Force when they fall short of compliance. Now, the FATF blacklist, which now is called the list or gray list, was and still remains its enforcement mechanism, which is aimed at publicly naming and shaming non-compliant countries with the aim of securing compliance to its standards, right? And it has implications. Once you are listed by the FATF, developmental lenders become very wary of dealing with you. Correspondent banking relationships are kind of skewed or to an extent, you, banks in your countries may be de-risked, right? Foreign investments become limited. The cost of remittances, which a lot of African countries depend heavily on, becomes even more expensive. So Nigeria was the first West African countries to be listed. And currently we have four African countries on the list, including Ghana, which is quite surprising because when you speak with a lot of people, the implication, the, the, the story you hear is that Ghana is doing quite well, but Ghana is still listed. Now, there are arguments that blacklisting in itself is a catalyst for improved compliance, right? Now, Julia Morse. Julia Moss argued this strongly in a recent Oxford University publication, basically saying when you blacklist countries, they are more geared to comply, largely because of the reputational clause and also and reputational, reputational cost and the monetary cost. Now, the question is that, or, or the issue with this is that it does not necessarily consider the dichotomy between formal and proactive compliance, right? As whilst countries may actually comply on paper, their willingness and ability to comply is actually limited, right? 
Professor Mascriando puts refers to this as the stigma paradox. So where, where countries would strategically elude regulation, right? So in, in paper, it does seem like they're complying, but in reality, if you live in Nigeria, if you follow the Nigeria news, if you know what's going on, you would know that compliance Nigeria maybe should be listed at this point, but it's not. So the question then becomes Dr. Zinge, you have two minutes. Okay, thank you. The question then becomes, what is the way forward, right? So on one hand, African countries may push for a stronger voice to influence global standards. And therefore, these global standards will start to recognize their local realities. Now, this seems very ideal and far-fetched, but in reality, it's not, right? The FATF in itself is currently exam examining the unintended consequences of erroneous application of its standards. And this is actually a pathway forward for African countries. Now, Again, the results are still unknown, but we hope that in the near future we'll see the outcome of this. And hopefully this might be a starting, a step forward for African countries. Alternatively, or rather alongside African countries, alongside seeking a voice, African countries ought to work towards improving their preconditions for effective regulation, notwithstanding their history, notwithstanding their colonial history or antecedents. Yes, we understand and we recognize that correlation, but at some point there has to be a moving forward. These approaches would no doubt cascade an alignment of the global standards with local realities. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Azinge for the insightful presentation. And uh, I wouldn't want to try to summarize her presentation. So we'll just go straight into the next session, which uh, our next speaker is Ms. Cheludo Tinanye Butale of Cyprus International University. She'll be speaking to us on the topic, global AML standards, implications for women NGOs. Ms. Butale, over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the lovely introduction. Um, I'd just like to uh, thank the organizers uh, for having organized such a, an amazing event. So my focus will be on the global anti anti-money laundering standards and the implications for women and governmental organizations. So let me just... So can you hear me? Yes, we can okay. hear you. Okay, okay. Okay. So my presentation outline will be as follows. I'll just briefly highlight uh, the global AML, anti-money laundering standards, then focus on the AFTA, FATF, and then give a definition of NPOs and the challenges of the interpretations of FATF's recommendations and the lawmaking process challenges and highlight just the global non-profit organization coalition, what it does, and how it's connected to the AFTA. And then I'll give uh, the impact on women and governmental organizations and just a few case studies and a conclusion. To start, the FATF has played a major role in setting up the global framework of norms designed to counter terrorism, financing, and money laundering. It extends and complements the UN SCR resolution or United Nations Security Council Res resolutions 1267, uh, 1373 and other resolutions. Basically these resolutions are like the Palermo conventions, Vienna conventions that deal with uh, transnational organized crimes or drug trafficking issues. So the AFT, the FATF uh, complements it in terms of issues of terrorist financing through its recommendation. So FATF is an international organization, as was mentioned by the earlier speakers, established in 1989 um, to enhance cooperation among states and combat to money laundering and terrorism financing. And its 40 recommendations uh, constitute the basic legal framework for 
preventing, detecting, and suppressing money laundering and terrorist financing. So I've just highlighted um, how the FATF complements the UN standards in terms of the Palermo, the Vienna Convention. So I won't dwell too much on that. I'll move straight to the FATF and what exactly it does, its background briefly. So it consists of 36 members, eight FATF star like regional bodies and 25 observer organizations, and its standards are applied in 180 jurisdictions. It also has mutual evaluations or assessments that rate countries' level of compliance according to um, largely compliant, not compliant, et cetera. And it regulates issues of great interest to, to the market uh, for investor confidence. But then again, um, the challenge with FATA, unlike other intergovernmental organizations, it's not regulated by an international treaty. And by it not being regulated by an international treaty, it's the way it's prone or can be prone to public scrutiny is limited due to that perspective. So within the FATF documents, uh, the definitions of nonprofit organization is as follows, a legal person or arrangement or organization that primarily engages in raising or disbursing funds for purposes such as charitable, religious, cultural, educational, social purposes, and carrying out other types of good works. And within that definition of the NPOs, the nonprofit organization is recommendation eight, which is intended to apply only to those NPOs that pose the greatest threat to terrorism financing. Um, not all NPOs are high risk, but Unfortunately, within the FATF's, FATF's document, it does not really distinguish between potential risk and actual abuse by terrorists. And as a result of this ambiguity, it may result in challenges in um, adopting a risk-based approach or proportional approach methods in terms of dealing with issues of NPOs and their association with terrorism. Um, financing. And then the types of NPOs that FATA highlights is the service role NPOs, uh, those that provide services such as health and education and social services and development and housing. And the expressive roles are those that undertake activities such as cultural recreation activities. Um, so most of the NPOs that are regarded as uh, a risk to terrorist um, a risk of abuse for terrorist financing is the service role NPOs, since they are regarded to be the ones that work within close proximity to active terrorist threats. But then again, we raise a question that by them working in close proximity within active terrorist threats, uh, does it, is, is it enough for, for us to then say that they are a threat? they could be aiding or helping with terrorist financing because there are some NGOs that help victims that are targeted by terrorists that are there to also help people there. So the, this is also part of the ambiguity or and the uh, clear statements that is mentioned within the FATF's um, document on MPOs. And then zoning in or coming to the FATAS 40 recommendation, particularly that that deals with the NPOs, which NPOs are also mean non-governmental organizations. So it's the, 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 the recommendation eight is supposed to address the particular vulnerability of NPOs to terrorism financing and abuse. Unfortunately, it has had numerous unintended consequences by it, we have seen that there's been increased state surveillance and regulation of, this, of the sector without any targeted or risk-based approach. There have been cases of over-regulation. MPOs face uh, difficulties or go through cumbersome registering and licensing laws and increased regulations of the sector. And we have seen banks closing accounts, um, you know, delays in accounts, refusing to transfer funds, 
or for NPOs as a result of, of, of this recommendation eight unintended uh, consequences. Because of the unintended consequences of this recommendation eight, uh, the Global Nonprofit Organization Coalition, um, which is engaged with FATA uh, most of the time, then was engaged by FATA to revise the recommendation eight. So by revising the recommendation eight, they focus on proportionate me measures in line with the risk approach to non-profit organization to protect NPOs from terrorist financing abuse. So they focus on this, that depending on the risk, whether the risk is high or low, that proportional measure or risk-based approach should be used to assess the perspective of, 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 of the NGOs. Unlike the previous, um, the previous uh, recommendation eight, it just then generalizes, generalized all NGOs as being vulnerable to, to terrorist fi funding or terrorism funding. But um, this new one is saying, focus on proportionate measures. However, within the statement that is saying, focus on proportionate members, we then ask ourselves, uh, that recommendation eight, does it really provide details for this risk-based approach in terms of how countries should undertake this risk-based approach and how they should involve the NPOs? As a result of this unclear wording or terms, uh, it may be a challenge for governments to make their own assessments and determine which NPOs are at high risk of financial abuse because of the statement of the revised um, recommendation eight. Um, the other challenge is the broad definition of the word terrorism financing. Terrorism financing normally within it's, it's defined as um, raising funds, transfer of funds for logistical support for, for, for terrorist groups. But how do we then zone it down to, 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 to the actual terrorist financing of NGOs. That is also the challenge in terms of the wording. And then the risk-based approach that was adopted in line still with a nonprofit organization. Um, the risk-based too was adopted in terms of to try and see where threats can exploit vulnerabilities. Um, so the way it is used or the way it's supposed to be used by countries is countries have to familiarize themselves with this definition of NPOs by FATA, and then from there recognize the vulnerabilities of those NPOs, those that may be vulnerable to threat of terrorist funding. And then from there, countries should have the relevant measures in place and adopt a risk-based approach to those sectors that they feel are like at high risk. So the challenge with this- Ms. Putale, can you summarize in two minutes? Okay, yes, I'll, okay. Okay, the challenge with, there's been a challenge in uh, implementing or understanding uh, the risk-based approach by, by, by various countries. Then the challenge of, you know, was lack of engagement of NGOs. And then we have the um, recommendation eight and interpretive note. Um, the challenge with this, again, it's that it has this wording of reasonable measures that MPOs should have reasonable measures to document the identity of their significant donors. But then reasonable measures, we ask ourselves, what are those reasonable measures? It's not really clear on what the reasonable measures mean. And then because there are various uh, NGOs that really deal with confidential or sensitive issues. They may have a challenge of revealing their beneficiaries or issues, revealing issues related to sensitive issues that they deal with like reproductive rights, rights of sex workers, LGBT. So the wording of also that interpretive recommendation is also a challenge. So the previous speakers have mentioned um, the, the process of FATA, the lawmaking process in a way by saying that it's exclusionary, it mostly benefits those from the developed countries and not those from the developing countries. So I'll just focus on the coalition, global coalition 
uh, NPO coalition to just highlight that also its engagement in terms of civil society from the South, it's limited. It does not address the concerns of those civil society from the South. Hence, we have seen uh, the impact of these money laundering standards on women and governmental organizations. The, the, um, the impact has been seen through uh, the limit of women rights organization access to foreign funding, uh, foreign um, donors funding more of international organization, more than women activists, because they're afraid of what their governments will say or how they'll be treated if they find, if they fund these women activists who operate in sensitive areas. So those are the other challenges. And the implementation of United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325 has been affected. This is also another problem of it. And then the de-risking has also affected issues of financial inclusion. So there are various cases of how uh, the part of recommendation has affected um, women NGOs in various countries that I've highlighted, like India, the Foreign Contribution Act, the national policy um, for in Sierra Leone that has also, the, the NGO policy, I mean, in Sierra Leone that has also had an impact on civil society in terms of uh, allowing them to operate. Ms. Ms. Butale, I would have yes. loved for you to continue, but we are way, way, way out of time. Okay, I'm just concluding, then I'm done. So okay. in a way, in a, yeah, in uh, the way in which the money laundering and counterterrorism laws have been designed and implemented, we can see that they really have taken little or no account of the, how women rights organizations operate. And it's important that women organizations should be engaged in the implementation of recommendation eight. They should be part of the processes so that you know things are more transparent, accountable, and the objectives are reached. The desired. Thank you very much for your time. Hello. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Butale, for your presentation. And yeah. uh, we are we are already out of time, but definitely we have to be fair to every party, every panelist to yeah. be able to present the paper. And uh, yes. I seriously appeal to the organizers to kindly just give us uh, some additional time. I know we're already out of time, but I wanted everybody to be able to speak oh, to their yeah. paper in a manner that uh, they will communicate what they have in mind. Uh, okay. I will invite Dr. Chijoke, Chijoke of Forgy now of the Liverpool John Moss University. He'll be speaking to us on the topic, the new CBN anti-money laundering. Dr. Chijoke of Forgy. Uh, uh, this is, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I, I wonder whether you're able to hear me. Yes, we can hear you very well. Right. I think I, I had sent across my slides to Joy, but it's fine. I, I could share it from here. Um, yeah, I think you have. You have. Yeah, go ahead and share. Thank you. Okay. Uh, um, thank you. Thank you very much. I think what I just do is share it from here. Um, it's been shared for you. It's already on the screen. Oh, okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very kind. I, I recognize that we're pressed for time, so I just maybe do it in seven minutes or so, um, so, so that we can move on to the next uh, cohort. But really, um, I recognize that um, our colleagues have spoken powerfully about the FATF and the structural issues uh, with AML regulation in the Global South. My own presentation will just uh, try to look at the uh, use of enforcement uh, uh, on the enforcement side. Uh, sorry. Um, and I'm just going to look at uh, the Central Bank of Nigeria's use of administrative sanctions uh, in combating uh, money laundering and um, CTF, I mean, in particular in the Nigerian banking sector. Uh, this is very much a work in progress. Uh, you, I think my email address is right at the start of the slide there. So feel free to send feedback and, and, and thoughts. Can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so basically, I'm, I'm just going to look at uh, the role of the CBN as a primary um, money laundering supervisor, uh, but also I think it's increasing use of uh, administrative sanctions. And I, we're just going to ask a few questions about where does this uh, leave us and where does this lead us to? Can we go to the next slide? Thank you. Um, I, I don't want to re-litigate uh, much of what has been said in the past about the Nigerian uh, AML regulatory uh, structure. 
but a, a number of um, uh, legislative instruments here that speak to uh, the regulation of money laundering in the Nigerian space. Can we go to the next slide? Thank you. Um, yes, but the CBN is a, a right at the heart of the Nigerian um, regulatory tapestry, supervisory tapestry, if you like. Um, it's the uh, key and primary supervisor for banks and uh, a number of financial services providers in the country. And the CBN's pass in this regard is uh, provided by complex patchwork of uh, legislative instruments. Uh, one example is the Banks and Other Financial, financial Institutions Act, BOFIA 2020, which recognizes the CBN's role as primary supervisor for AML within the Nigerian banking and financial space, uh, but also empowers you know, the regulator to make policies and issue guidance uh, related to AML and CTF. Can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so this slide looks principally at the number of um, sort of financial actors supervised by the CBN. We've got deposit money banks, of course. We've got microfinance banks, uh, primary mortgage banks, uh, payment, what, what, is, what the CBN now calls payment services banks, essentially under the name for uh, payment services providers that also provide um, uh, things like cards and so on and so forth. And so we, you also got um, um, bureau change operators and some of our financial uh, companies. And increasingly, there is now a view that the CBN is also encroaching on the uh, fintech space as well. Can we go to the next slide? And so I think, you know, the structure, the microstructure of the Nigerian financial space really perhaps uh, makes us recognize, you know, the uh, increasing importance of the CBN. And I think that that importance is highlighted by the fact that in 2018, uh, the central bank uh, um, issued um, a set of uh, regulations, one of which was the administrative sanctions regulations of 2018. Now, these uh, sanctions were introduced to ensure Nigeria's compliance with uh, Recommendation 35 of the Financial Action Tax Force, which indicates the need for effective, proportionate, and dissuasive sanctions in uh, combating AML. Um, and really, I think the need for this uh, uh, for Nigeria to comply with uh, Recommendation 35 was highlighted in the GEABA 2007 Mutual Evaluation Report. Um, which essentially called the Nigerian authorities to strengthen the sanctions re regime against uh, money laundering. Can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. And um, in considering this re regime, it's important to recognize that it has almost an exclusive focus on monetary um, fines. Uh, um, essentially, if you uh, breach uh, certain uh, money laundering requirements on your bank or, or, or a financial institution, you could be fined. Um, I should stress as well that CBN guidance does suggest that uh, there are other sanctions, such as the revocation of banking license. Um, you know, looking at the regime closely, there are 48 possible infractions. I'm not going to go through all of them because I recognize that we have pressed for time here. Um, but it's important to recognize that this is, of course, part of what is now a very evolving and some might say stri slightly strident, um, you know, compliance environment for banks in Nigeria. Important as well to note that these, these sanctions can be imposed by the uh, CBN after an examination of the relevant financial institution or at the recommendation of relevant agencies. Next slide. Thank you. Um, so how are sanctions determined? Well, the CBN will, of course, look at a number of factors, one of which is the nature and seriousness of the breach, um, the duration and the frequency of the breach, uh, whether uh, um, benefits were gained or losses um, avoided as a result of the breach, uh, also the conduct of the financial institution itself and persons uh, concerned in its um, uh, leadership team. It's also important to know that the CBN will also consider uh, the previous record of the financial institution and whether there are uh, ongoing regulatory enforcement activities against it as well. The next slide. Um, so a few examples, I'm not gonna go through all three because we're pressed for time. I'm just going to stick to one, which is uh, failure to render suspicious transaction reports to the uh, Nigerian Financial Intelligence 
unit here, uh, the uh, executive compliance uh, chief of the, of the bank could cop a fine of 2.5 million naira, which is, some might say, is quite weighty in the Nigerian uh, context. But also they say, so not just the um, chief executive, uh, the chief uh, compliance officer, the bank itself uh, could also cop a 20 million naira fine. Um, and some might say that this is uh, deeply, deeply weighty. Um, I should stress that these are minimum fines. So, of course, you know, the CBN could uh, increase it uh, dependent on the uh, um, nature of the breach. Can we go to the next slide? So I'm just going to try to evaluate what this um, regime is uh, principally all about. Uh, um, well, it's obviously a very key and important addition to, as I said, a complex and evolving uh, regulatory environment for Nigerian banks. Uh, there is also... Uh, and this is, you know, an important point, a clear focus on what I call the double-edged sword of enterprise-level responsibility and, crucially, individual accountability. So not just the enterprise, uh, the fines are not just targeted at the particular financial institution, but also uh, at the key uh, um, members of its leadership team. I would also argue that the um, administrative sanctions re regime is, uh, of course, a very, very important tool for corporate governance improvement, not least because it focuses on things like uh, board responsibility, risk management, uh, training, uh, internal control, compliance, uh, monitoring of suspicious uh, activity. That's also, I think, very, very important signs of um, some form of regulatory flexibility in the sense that sanctions are usually graduated on the size of the financial, of the relevant financial um, institution. Can we go to the next slide? Thank you. Um, uh, since uh, its launch in April 2018, the CBN has seemingly applied you know, the regime to a number of banks. I think reports suggest that the regime has been using at least uh, six to 10 um, times. It's not entirely clear, and I should stress that this is quite tentative, not least because the uh, CBN has this really, I would say, uh, uh, um, unfortunate practice of not really um, publishing enough information uh, about you know, its, uh, its use of, um, of the fines. Um, and sadly, uh, many of us who are researching this space have to go to the pages of newspapers and also look at the financial statements of the organizations. Uh, there are also questions, and this, of course, does raise fundamental questions of transparency. Uh, and I think that this is um, one of the challenges of the um, regime as a whole. Can we go to the next slide? Um, there are a number of challenges and issues that I highlight. Uh, one of them is the transparency of the uh, administrative sanction regime. It's not uh, the, the use of, of it by the CBN is not uh, entirely clear. Um, you know, uh, uh, fines are not published on the, are not very often published on the pages of the regulator itself. One has to dig um, through the uh, pages of um, new newspapers uh, to, to find out. Um, also important to recognize that the increasing use of administrative sanctions does add to this um, age long debate and conversation, frankly, about the CBN's uh, quasi judicial. Powers. I, I note that uh, Fola Adiemo uh, has written a powerful 2017 piece about this and about the need for um, stronger uh, um, accountability structures. I think it's also the risk of what I call over enforcement. And this might uh, 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 call for a risk based or what uh, John Braithwaite would describe as a responsive um, uh, supervisory style. Um, there's also the probable risk that fines are then internalized by the banks as a cost of doing um, business, and then ultimately passed on to, uh, um, you know, to the uh, clients of the banks. So, so I think that you know, this is certainly something that we need to um, watch out for. Um, the, there are also, in my view, the problems, the, the problem, sorry, of newer actors on the scene, um, payment and remittance services uh, providers. These are typically smaller firms, You've got to try to have a responsive approach, maybe to, to see whether, in fact, you know, the infraction does generate a sizable amount of risk. And if it doesn't, then maybe fines might not be the appropriate uh, tool. It, it might be best you know, to consider you know, a wider set of tools. 
Um, I, I think that there's also a, a case. Possible to write, wrap up in two minutes, please. Yes, yes. Uh, it, there's also a, a case for a remediation approach. Um, it's it's vital that we that we do not just stick to the uh, stick, but we also have a a a carrot approach as well uh, to to make sure that we're not just uh, you know um, clamping down on banks, but you provide a pathway for them to uh, sort out you know the internal control issues in the first place. I think this really brings me to the end of the presentation. Thank you very much to the organizers uh, for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Chijioke Ofoji. And i um, very grateful to our formidable panelists who have been able to present their papers to the audience. And in the interest of time, we are not going to take the question and answer session now. Rather, we try to do that at the end of the next section, which is the session six. But before I wrap this up, and then probably come back for the question and answer session, if we have that time, I just wanted to take this time out to thank the panelists, Professor Abdullah Hishehu, Dr. Constance Gikoyo, Dr. Nkechi Azinge, Dr. Uh, Miss Chelude, Cheludo Butale, and indeed, Dr. Chijoke, Chijoke Ofoji. Thank you for your time. I hand it over to the organizers. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. If I could just um, call on Ross uh, to please come up and moderate our oh. next session for us, please. Thank you. Yes, I have been. Let me call you in five minutes.